All right, we're at time. Time to get going. Uh, it is, I, I can't even tell you looking at the screen and seeing all of these old friends and uh, incredible leaders. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here uh, with you today. I wish we could meet up in person and go have a cocktail or something and catch up on the last couple of years and all the craziness that's been going on. Um, and and uh, I look forward to doing that um, when we can. Um, someone just asked if I'm calling the old. <laughs> Indeed, no, we're all getting younger, I'm sure, through COVID. But uh, we have an important conversation to have today and I wanna be sure that we jump right into it. We've got three great leaders with us. Um, Tara Lynn Gray is the director of the Office of Small Business Advocate in the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Um, incredible leader, important perspective to hear, especially during these times. I know many of you know Katie Farrick, who's the Senior Director of Workplace Programs, Community and Sustainability at LinkedIn. And we have Aaron Kilmer uh, Neal, who's the Executive Director and the Chief Impact Officer at Beneficial State Foundation. And we're going to um, hear from all of them about the issue of equitable recovery. Um, you know, as you know, this pandemic, especially in this region, has been full of dichotomies. Some tech companies have made more money in the last year and a half than ever, and whole industries have been shuttered. Many of the nonprofits lost their typical funding and support, even as the need for their services skyrocketed. We had communities that were most in need of vaccines because they were working on the front lines and not just working at home. And those were often the least likely to get vaccinated. And as the recovery began, many of the communities in most need and the organizations that serve those communities were the least likely to get funding and support coming from various levels of government, coming from businesses and coming from um, some foundations. Of course, the pandemic has really been a reflection of the inequality that we've been struggling with prior to 2020. It simply laid bare those things that were present and exacerbated others. Now, of course, we're in this rush to return to normal, to get rid of the masks, to get back to work, to feel normal again. But how do we address these exacerbated inequities as we run towards recovery? How do we as practitioners make the recovery more equitable while recognizing, of course, that during this tumultuous time, we also had a moment of racial reckoning uh, within this country. And that's what we're here to talk about today, hopefully to give you some ideas on actions that you can take on this notion of equitable recovery. Um, we encourage questions and we'll have time for an open conversation, but I wanted to start, so please be sure to um, put those in the chat, but I wanted to um, start with just some groundwork and sort of some common understanding and, and ask each of the panelists to talk about this term equitable recovery that we're hearing about. It's getting bandied about now fairly often, especially in the social impact philanthropy space. And I'm wondering what that means to you and how you would define it. And uh, I'll start with Katie. Well, thanks, Sid. Uh, hello, everybody. So nice to be here and see, see some of you virtually. And hopefully I'll see all of you um, uh, in person soon, as Sid said. So we had so many systemic issues that predate COVID. And like Sid said, they've just gotten worse um, and some new ones emerged. Uh, so I certainly am not here because I have all the answers. I'm here to learn as well. Um, so I would, the way I would define or the way I'm looking at how we might provide better, a better equity lens to the grants that we give is really trying to understand the system, you know, like take a more systems approach to learning about what the problem is that the, um, the requester, the organization, the nonprofit is trying to solve and who they're working with and what the project that they're trying to get funding for will actually do, who it will help, how it will help. Is it is the chance of it succeeding, um, you know, high? So, uh, so that's one way. I think there's loads of great, more, um, you know, high level definitions, but that's just one lens with which I'm looking through in the local level. Uh, with my work at LinkedIn. Aaron, why don't we turn to you? Same question. 
Sure, thank you. Yeah, and thanks also for having me. And I don't know uh, as many of the folks probably on this call as, as some others do. So just saying again, hi, I'm Erin Kilmer Neal. I'm Executive Director and Chief Impact Officer at Beneficial State Foundation, which is an operating foundation, not a philanthropic foundation, just to give you a sense. And our role is really around financial justice and changing the banking system for good. So that is the lens you know, with which I look at work. And um, I haven't really asked myself this big picture question before that you're asking today. And so I made some notes for myself about, okay, if we're really asking this big picture question, about what is equitable recovery. I thought about it in a couple of different ways. One is how, you know, what is the process? So first there's a structure, right? We need, as Katie said, we need to look at things from a systems lens. We need to recognize that uh, people were systemically and intentionally placed in inequitable positions in society. And that, so we can't, um, yes, we need to um, deprogram, you know, racism, but we also need to just revamp all of the systems. And then what is the process? What is the path, right? So we need to center the voices of those who have been suppressed. We need to erase the bias, but we also need to not focus on just providing equitable um, access to programs, design, resources. We need to provide targeted resources, right, to folks. And then beyond that, even if we're providing targeted resources to get to a place of sort of equity at a starting point, we also need to provide redress and reparations. And so that's sort of a process piece. And then where, what does it look like? You know, if we really got there, what would it look like? That would mean distributed power where our leaders and legislators look like our communities across the board. Distributed ownership where there's um, ownership in land, ownership in businesses. We start to use exciting pathways like equity funds um, that are more democratized, worker ownership, land trust, all of those things that create more ownership and more wealth accumulation across society. And then, and then I think there are elements like just within our organizations where we can really build equity from a structural perspective, like CEO um, to median or minimum page, uh, wage ratios, right? So rather than having 300 to one or 100 to one, having single digit, to one ratios between the highest and lowest paid worker. So all of these I think are possible now because the pandemic of final racial reckoning that a lot of us white people are realizing for the first time, hurricanes, climate change, all of these things are making people realize that the inequity isn't caused by um, the hard work or the luck of certain people, but it has been caused by intentional systems and forces out of our control, right? Like climate change and pandemics. So that I think gives people and society a new chance to think about how we look at everything and to build new systems that sort of allow for that equity. Sorry, that was a really long answer, but it was just such a big question. I had to really think it through. No, it's great. We're gonna keep, we're gonna dive into it even more. Tara, how about the same question? How, how, what do you think of the term equitable recovery and, and what does it mean for you? Thank you. When I think of equitable recovery, um, I think about equitable economic recovery. And as I think about that, I think about what the prior situation was. And I ask, was the prior system equitable? And I think not. So as we build back and as we recover, what are we recovering, right? Are we recovering what was lost or are we building something new that reflects new priorities and reflects what we learned in 2020? And, and I posit that we learned a lot in 2020. Um, there were some silver linings in um, the devastation that we experienced um, due to COVID. We learned that Black lives do indeed matter. We learned that API hate is not new. We learned that small businesses do indeed need technical assistance in addition to capital to grow and scale. We learned that America must reckon with her racist past in order to heal and be the best that she can be. We learned that community is not community 
without community institutions, and many of those are small businesses, and they create opportunity. Uh, they create opportunity for young people. They create opportunity for those that um, often cannot make it to a mainstream job market. They are places where learning um, takes place. And so I think that as we look toward economic recovery and building back, we have got to embrace those new things that we learned in 2020, and we've got to build according to those new blueprints. And lastly, I'll say that um, I am a recent appointee. I just um, started in this position end of April this year, and I accepted the governor's appointment because not only do I love the work of the advocate's office because I've been a small business owner and a small business advocate for 25 years, but most importantly, I'm proud to be part of an administration that is a, doing more for small business than I've ever seen in my adult life, but also an administration that has said that they envision a California for all and that no longer are the disparities that lead to inequities okay. And that we, as we build California and California's future, we are building a future that includes all of its diversity within. Tara, let's continue with you and we'll circle back around in the other direction for the next question. And, and it's really diving into your work from your role, from your perspective, what do you see as the priorities of recovery for your organization in particular? And, and let's all recognize, we have three just incredible voices for this conversation. We've got Katie, we're through LinkedIn, so many people who are looking for that next job, who are coming out of the pandemic, thinking about how their career changes, are going to LinkedIn to think about that. We have Aaron, who's gonna change the entire banking system in the United States, which by the way, um, uh, I, we had time to connect beforehand and I know the ideas there and that the actual actions that people can think about and take are, are ones that reflect across our other industries. And then Tara, you are of course on the ground with small businesses across the state, thinking about how they come out of um, this, this pandemic and, and, and um, economic downturn. And so Tara, I just wonder, tell us sort of what your office is doing, sort of, you know, what, what's the actual work and, and how it might reflect for some of the larger corporations, for foundations, et cetera. How should we be thinking about partnership with small businesses or the priorities that you have for them in the coming, in the next couple of years? Yeah, thank you for that uh, question, Sid. My office, of course, was established by statute, the Office of the um, uh, Small Business Advocate, which is inside of the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. And so we really have um, four missional objectives or priorities. The first is to be a resource provider, making sure that small businesses have access to capital, access to markets, networks, and basically have what they need to grow and scale. Then secondly, as the name implies, we are an advocate, elevating the voice of small business across state government, making sure that we understand the impact to small business of the things that we do in government. Third, which is clearly a, a priority based on our experiences this last 18 months, is focusing on resilience and preparing for disaster. And we know, unfortunately, that COVID-19 is not uh, the last disaster that we will see or experience, um, especially with the impending you know, wildfires that we have in California every, every year. So we need to, to, to focus on that as well. But lastly, um, a very important objective um, of ours that relates specifically to this conversation is centered around economic growth and our desire to make sure that economic growth is equitable. So we are working to create an inclusive small business ecosystem that eliminates opportunity gaps across zip codes, race, 
and gender. And so our focus is not just economic growth, but economic mobility for folks that, that, that need an opportunity to move from one station to another. Some of the things that we are doing in my office, um, we administer several programs. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the California Economic um, or excuse me, the um, COVID relief, the small business COVID relief uh, grant, uh, which was a $4 billion investment, um, the first and largest of its kind. We led the nation uh, in, in that. And we are um, still to this day uh, making selections and awards, spending that $4 billion. Then we additionally um, have a venues grant, $150 million um, that has been set aside to help venues come back. We uh, just released um, yesterday the micro business grant program. That's a $50 million investment in our smallest entrepreneurs. And these are small businesses earning less than $50,000 a year and less than five employees. Um, we also just launched yesterday our Inclusive Innovation Hubs uh, RFP, and we will be designating 10 iHubs uh, across the state, and these are meant to spur innovation and um, startups in tech sectors, life sciences, and we have an emphasis on founders of color, women, and other underrepresented uh, business groups. So we, um, as I said a moment ago, I am fortunate enough to administer the largest small business focused budget ever in the history um, of this office and super excited to be able to participate in um, an equitable economic recovery for California's 4.1 million small businesses. Thank you so much, Tara. Erin, let's turn to you. Same question, can you tell us about uh, what you see as broad priorities for recovery, especially as it relates to your work and your industry? Sure, thank you. And just, um, I feel like our work is so related to Tara's and just appreciate everything that you had to share. Um, so yeah, thinking about the banking system, I think there are, you know, there are multiple ways in which this is relevant to I think everyone on this call. One is that the banking system is, $22 trillion in assets. And that's basically all of our money, right? So wherever that money goes, that's your money. And so when we're thinking about changing the banking system, there's two parts. One is internally, how do we change this system, our structures, our cultures, just like every other institution, every other company, every other nonprofit? How do we, you know, peel back the layers and uncover where white supremacy culture lives within and, and sort of transform it and explore. So there's all of that that we're doing and looking at the culture of banks, of our own bank, of our own foundation and saying, how do we have hard conversations? Um, how do we be comfortable with being uncomfortable so that we can actually make the change um, that is required? How do we um, internally pay differently, um, give worker power. Our bank just unionized, um, first bank to unionize in 40 years. So there's all kinds of things internally that we're looking at with our own bank and foundation and with um, a program that we're doing around equitable bank standards that I'll speak to in a little bit. Um, so looking at what is the governance structure? How do we change that? How are our operations different? And then there's the sort of, um, program and product side of things that I can speak to more later, but those things are specific to banking. The things that aren't specific to banking around the governance, around the um, operations, we are learning from existing standards. And that, that piece I think is really helpful and relevant to all organizations to look at the just label, to look at the global diversity, equity and inclusion benchmarks, to look at the B Corp, the B impact assessment, all of those uh, structures, all of those frameworks, all of those um, measurement tools have provided us really helpful pathways in figuring out a, you know, a direction forward. And I think we're applying that to banking, but those things can be applied uh, to every company and every organization. Absolutely. Katie. Thanks, Sid. So 
at LinkedIn, we focus a lot on economic opportunity and equitable access to economic opportunity. Then the other part of my remit is environmental sustainability. And so one example that of an organization that we're, you know, as a grantee, a strong partner of ours in the region is Grid Alternatives, and they focus on both economic and environmental justice. Um, they have workforce development training so that people in our communities are getting the skills they need to access, you know, uh, economic mobility careers as well as access to clean energy. And so part of our Build Back Better, our equitable recovery needs to also include um, environmental justice. As we all know, uh, not every community is impacted equally in climate change impacts. And so we need pathways and uh, ways to support a broader set of people getting skills in order to uh, build back our entire infrastructure better uh, from clean energy sources, as well as just, you know, uh, much better economic opportunity. So that's one example. Another is housing. The last thing we should be doing as a state or a region is pushing people that are at lower incomes out of our regions. We actually need to include everyone in our region. And so providing more housing opportunities remains a critical piece of our strategy. One project example that speaks to that systems approach is a project home key site. You're probably familiar with that. It's a state of California project. There's one that opened in Mountain View that the city and Life Moves collaborated on with investment from um, partners like LinkedIn and others. Um, and that's an important one because it'll reduce the unhoused by 50% in Mountain View in one year. So that speaks to um, it was a project that was real. It wasn't a theoretical kind of a, let's talk about it around a round table for, for years and years. It was actually happening. There are people living there now within one year. And so, um, you know, that's, that's an example of uh, a couple different grantees or projects that, that represent kind of the, uh, you know, a, a, an equitable lens to how we're giving grants now. I think we've laid a good foundation of sort of what we're talking about here and the work that each of you do. Now, I'd love to just get into the discussion. Um, there's themes that keep coming up, right? Sustainability, we're talking about systems change, we're talking about empowerment. And I'd love to just talk a little bit about, there's no panacea, right? There, if there were a simple thing that all of us at the different companies could go and do, and we, we would suddenly be leading to it, a new way of envisioning all of this, we would all be doing it immediately. I think there are critical elements and I'd love to just start to dive into some of that. And some of that I think we see in a consideration of long-term and short-term investments and changes. I know a lot of companies um, after the um, death of George Floyd and, and sort of a racial reckoning across the country made large donations to a host of different organizations that look, work in the racial equity space. And in conversation with a lot of folks in this field, you know, the, the, they are struggling with how to embed that work in the longer term, right? Like initial investments were made, but where is that really gonna be three or five years down the road? And how do you sustain that conversation within the company? How do you sustain that work? And so I'm wondering if you could give us examples of, you know, with, with um, programs that you're running, with initiatives that you think really get to some of these issues of empowerment, sort of engaging the community, of sustainability and thinking about these for the longer term, um, you know, and thinking about system change, like you've been talking about, Erin, how do you really get to some of that structural change? Any of those areas where, where you think we can um, learn from some of the work that you're already doing um, would be great, would be great to hear. And Erin, uh, why don't we start with you this time? Sure, thank you. Yeah, big question. Um, and I think, you know, I'm a big fan of checklists. So I'll just say that right off the bat. Like, I really think we recognize that um, racial equity, whether it's grant making investments, isn't just a category, right? It's across the board. And so how do we look at, how do we ask questions about power building, about equity in everything that we do? So if it's a, if it's a, um, a framework for grant making, a framework for investments and application that it's just sort of inherently built into the DNA through 
checklists. And then really specifically, one of the things that we're doing um, that I think is can be translated. Um, so one of the big problems uh, in banking and in getting capital to those small businesses that Tara was talking about is that underwriting within banking is um, it kind of looks at everyone the same way, even though we already know that people come to the bank with very different profiles and that those profiles are the result of theft of land, theft of wealth, prevention of income, right? Just setting people up in a very different space, setting black and brown and people of color in a very different starting point than, um, than white people and privileged people. So we have to say, we have to rethink what underwriting looks like to say, we're not gonna address and assess everyone the same way. Well, we can't do that in a vacuum. So what we're doing is we built a national working group um, across the country of not just banks, but banks, credit unions, um, CDFIs, uh, community development financial institutions, academics, researchers, advocates to say, what can we do to sort of dismantle the way we do races or racism, the way we do underwriting now and, um, and rethink it, right, from, the, from, the, from scratch. And so we have sort of that layer of a working group, which meets on a monthly basis, and we're having really good conversations, we're sharing case studies, but we also don't want just those practitioners to be part of the voice, that's a very important voice, but we want to make sure that the actual borrowers and applicants, people who applied for loans and didn't get them, what was their story, what was their experience, how did it actually feel what information were they asked for? So in addition to the working group, we're, having, we're building an uh, applicants of color advisory council. So we're finding what is a way to share, have those conversations, have those voices that isn't extractive, that isn't taking too much of their time and requiring to be part of a bigger group and is also compensating people for their time. So that's one way that we're looking at how do we learn from the entire community um, to, re to rethink underwriting and hopefully get a lot more credit a lot more loans, a lot more business development, a lot more home ownership in communities of color. Yeah, and I think that's definitely a theme that we're seeing with best practices in this um, space coming out of um, the pandemic where there's not just um, you know, an effort to bring people to the table, but to really um, give up some power or share that power and, and lead to real changes um, within systems from what we're hearing from folks. So thank you for that example, very helpful. Tara, how about you? Same, same question. Um, would you repeat the question, please? No I was called by, by Aaron's answer and then sidetracked by, um, and I'm gonna butcher your name, I apologize in advance, Quang Kwa? Um, the the link that she put in, I turned to check out those seven principles. So I apologize. Could you repeat the question? No worries. Hey, we're just getting into the examples of programs that you're running that are focused on some of these themes that we're hearing about, which are, you know, thinking about um, community engagement and really empowerment in that way, thinking about sustainability and longer term engagement, thinking about systemic change and that, um, you know, the real need to think about systems. Perfect. I have been appropriately redirected. Thank you, Sid. Um, so I mentioned some of the programs um, that we are operating earlier, but I really kind of want to dive into something. Erin um, and Katie both hit on something um, that I think is important and worthy of noting, and that is about housing and about his, his sustainability. You know, 50% of all small businesses are run from home. And so that makes housing policy, housing affordability and accessibility a small business issue. Um, I also think that um, people of color, most particularly blacks and browns who have a tendency to be at the bottom of the economic spectrum, um, have difficulty accessing new markets. And um, our EV markets, our electrification opportunities, all of those things, um, EV mobility, 
um, bike sharing, ride sharing, all of those things. Um, those are new and emerging markets and not so emerging more, but still new. And uh, we have to work on how to create opportunities for uh, people of color and women to gain access to those new opportunities, to do job training, to um, be able to participate in the contracting opportunities around there. We need to be active in policy to make sure that there is adequate representation. Um, when we talk about equity, it's really about how, in my opinion, policies are written, who's written into and who's written out of policy, and, and not really a function of intention to exclude, just that when you're not a part of the conversation, those priorities and those things that matter to you and your community are not put on the table and considered. So I think that all of those areas, you're right, said there is no panacea. But there is one thing that I do think that we have to deal with, and that is what was discussed earlier in the opening session. Michael McAfee said earlier that our government is hostile to people of color. And I believe that while that has been true historically, I think we are at a moment, certainly in the state of California, where we have an administration that has appointed more people of color to leadership positions, including judges, than any other administration in California's history. So I think that we are seeing decision making change and be influenced by the new voices or additional voices that have been added to the conversation. So we have an opportunity to set priority and to include people who have systematically been excluded before. Last thing I will say on, on this, because I probably have talked too much, is I have these four things, these four pillars that I think um, are required for uh, solutions in these areas. And the first I've said many times in um, panels like this is that we all, and most particularly philanthropy in making investments has to move from being transactional to relational. At my prior position, I was the chief executive officer of the Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce and Chamber Foundation, which was a fledgling nonprofit when I got there. And I left them in a fairly robust um, uh, financial position and set up for property ownership. Uh, I, that was enabled by solid relationships with philanthropy, by insisting that those that we encountered in the fundraising process built a relationship with us. It's not just about submitting the grant, do we line up with your priorities, and then we get it or we don't. It's really about building a relationship investing in the community, investing in the leadership. And that's what um, organizations that are run by people of color need. We need significant relationships and those relationships shift power and they create importance and they create influence that is otherwise void. Second, we need to move from sound bites to sound partnerships, right? We are after the news story. We are after, you know, when we talk about small business, everybody wants to be a unicorn. That's about a sound bite. That's not sound partnerships that build um, relationships and that build an ecosystem that can then support the economic um, activity of those that are involved in the ecosystem. My third point is, we need to move from polarization to possibilities. It needs to be okay to be in groups like this and to ideate and to just examine all the possibilities rather than determining right and wrong and good and bad. We need to to strengthen the bonds amongst us that are trying to solve the problems and give each other the respect 
that we all deserve for bringing different ideas and past experiences and, and, and work history and all of that to the table and it all needs to be respected. My last point is this, we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. We have to say it's okay to call racism racism, to call wrong wrong, and to demand something different. And yes, it makes some people uncomfortable, but without discomfort, we cannot change. Hear, hear. It is, uh, I'm so happy that we have your voice. Uh, uh, on this panel, but uh, in leadership for their state as well. Um, Tara, thank you for those words. I, um, I want to be sure that we give people on the call, um, as I was saying, there's no panacea, but I know people are thinking about their next steps, especially since, and I, knowing a lot of people on this call, there are folks who are committed to this work for the right reasons, and they struggle with the work and the systems change that they're trying to do amongst their team, amongst their company, amongst the industry, and out in the community. And at each of those levels, at a policy level, I mean, at all of these things, it is, um, it's tough, it's tough. And so how we do that in partnership, really thinking about um, building on your words, Tara, who we're talking to, the ways that we engage community or others, again, at any of those different levels. I wonder if you could each give us an example um, related to partnerships in particular that you're looking at now, um, maybe policies around them that are different than before. What, what, give us an example of something that you're doing that, that sort of brings it to life um, and lessons learned if you can already coming out of this. And Katie, Katie, we'll start with you. Great, uh, thanks. And that's perfect because I definitely couldn't follow Tara in that last question. So um, really, really inspiring um, words. So I, the example I would give is we are uh, trying to analyze. So we, we know that most of our carbon impacts come from our supply chain, therefore economic opportunity does. And so Tara was talking about the um, small businesses often that are operating out of a home, how do those entrepreneurs get access to becoming a supplier to a company like a LinkedIn or you know, uh, any of you know, the companies represented here? And so we have a partnership that we've formed you know, by virtue of their parent, our parent company, Microsoft, um, through our workplace team, our strategic sourcing team that does this work, this is their role, uh, a responsible supply chain program and uh, we're, we're intentionally ensuring by way of creating uh, basically sourcing coaches to go into the community and help small entrepreneurs of color navigate the uh, RFP process successfully in order to set them up for ongoing success. Um, many companies have a you know, a, a lot of the, the people in business will just default to doing business with who, whomever they have always done business with. And we need to change that. That's a systems change. And so, um, you know, we're definitely at early stages, but I just, you know, wanted to speak to that as an emerging partnership, a uh, different approach that we think will fundamentally cho change economic opportunity from our purchasing power uh, and make our supply chain a lot more um, representative as well as sustainable, so. Great example, Erin? Yeah, thanks. And I saw there's a question for me too, which I could answer now or later, depending on what you want, Sid. Do you have a preference? Let's, let's do it now. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Ali. The, your question about how we're, how we're thinking about compensation for the advisory committee. Um, we have not landed on uh, an answer yet, but uh, the process or the philosophy or principles behind it um, and the way that we're looking at it is what is the, you know, they're subject matter experts. So this is a fair market wage, right? I mean, basically, if you're paying people for their lived experience, they, they have a PhD in the topic that you're trying to understand. And so people should be paid at that at that level. And we're literally going to look at that from, a, you know, how many hours is the advisory committee. So I envision 
a wage like that that's that's relevant and then and then figuring out the number of hours. So we'll see where we land. Happy to share what we end up with. Um, and then yeah, in terms of our example, I mean the big thing that I alluded to or mentioned explicitly earlier is our equitable bank standards. Um, I don't know if people here know, um, you know, I think most people here know about redlining and I've already talked about how big the banking industry is, but what people might not be familiar with is the fact that you know, Wall Street was the location of slave auctions, that banks have used enslaved people as collateral, that um, banks have essentially been the grease to take extracted wages from forced and, and free labor to people with money and power, right? So that banks have been that conduit and then have taken their own piece along the way, right? So there's a long, steep history in banking that, that has really exacerbated and helped create the inequities that, that we live in today. So our, our idea is, okay, well, how, how do we envision a new bank? What is the pathway? What are, what are the benchmarks that, looks, that it looks like to be a triple bottom line or an equitable bank? So that, that um, program that we're working on includes five different areas. What does governance look like at a triple bottom line, socially responsible bank? What do the operations look like? So those two I talked about earlier because they're replicable to other industries. What do lending and investing look like? So how do we make sure that we can proactively lend to communities of color, that we can fight for regulation change that enables us to actually do that proactive lending? How do we make sure we're not lending to fossil fuels, right? So put benchmarks around that. So lending, products and services, how do we make sure that products and services are designed in a fair way? And then advocacy and, and corporate citizenship, how do we make sure that we're not lobbying for the industry, but we're really advocating for the community? And so we have these sort of five areas that we're working on is this um, large banking standards. So people know what to look for. They have a pathway from essential to emerging to industry leading and will help walk along the way. So we can do this together. We really believe that banks can help lead this change. Um, and we have a responsibility to because we helped lead the inequity uh, over the, our history. So I'm really excited and we're gonna have technical advisory committees of folks uh, across the country to help us um, kind of review our first set and, and build from there. We have so much more to cover and we do not have the time to do it. That is the problem. Uh, there's so many more things to think about and, and talk about. And, and I think what's important is that this is, we are in partnership um, together. We are in community together in this work. We need to continue the conversation and continue to learn um, from each other. I'm gonna ask a lightning round question um, as, we, as we wrap things up here in the next couple of minutes about um, next steps. You know, fo fo I know people on this call are action oriented. They wanna, you know, what, what am I gonna do next? What, what, what can I do um, within the organization that I'm in or the work that, that I'm involved in um, to, to create the change and the kinds of changes that we're talking about today? And I, and I ask each of our panelists to just offer up, um, what, would, what would you recommend that first step being to, to lead to some of the results that we're talking about, that first recommended um, step. Uh, and uh, Tara, we'll start with you. Wow, I wanted to go last. <laughs> Does somebody else want to jump in? Does somebody else want to go before? No, I, no, I won't pass the buck, you called on me. Um, I think um, one of the things that we could do is to look at structural problems. So as each of us is in our microcosm, when we run across an issue or an undesirable outcome that we examine, is there something structural here that needs to be changed? Is there a systemic barrier? And if we all just looked in our own areas to um, eliminate uh, systemic barriers and structural issues, I think it could go a long way. Thank you. Erin? Uh, I would say just start with the culture, have the conversations, because as soon as that's in the ether, that's going to help, you know, change the programs, the products, the philanthropy, and use the benchmarks I talked about, Just Label, Global, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and, um, and B Corp. Katie? One very simple first step that hopefully most of us have already taken is just to do a, an analysis of who our grantees are 
are those organizations led by a diverse uh, executive team, by a diverse board? Um, you know, are you know what is the who are you giving money to? Are you really um, aware? So raising awareness by a simple um, study that isn't you know you don't have to really overthink it, uh, but but that's an important first step, I think. Thank you so much to each of our panelists for taking the time today. Really appreciate um, you know, your words and more especially the work that you're doing every day and the way that you do it. Um, it is making a difference. It's incumbent on all of us to think about how to lead to these broader, bigger changes. And, and you're really leaders in this space. And, and we thank you for sharing your ideas and your thoughts. I want to thank everybody else who joined us today during the breakout session. We invite you to head back to Swap Card to enjoy uh, DJ Lady Ryan until the closing plenary, which begins at noon. I don't miss the exciting conversation between MCG CEO Dwayne Marsh and Heather McGee, um, who, uh, of course, is a world-renowned advocate for justice and the author of The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. We are in this work as a community and we need to continue these important conversations, not just to inspire each other, but to really understand best practices and how we can work together to think about empowerment and community building, to think about longer term sustainability of this work and really about structural change um, for the longer term. So thank you everybody for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you in just a few minutes. Back at the closing plenary.